Patmos is a small island. It's one of the uh, Dodecanese Islands. This is where John the Apostle was exiled in the 90s by Emperor Domitian. When he was put there, that's when he wrote the book of Revelation. As far as we know, the island was relatively uninhabited uh, until many centuries after John was there. And then a monastery was built about a thousand years after John was on the island. Uh, this monastery, called the Monastery of St. John the Theologian, was built atop the mountain on Potmos. It was built in about 1088, and it's a huge fortress. It's uh, 50 foot tall walls that are 12 feet thick, something like that, just ridiculous, that would keep out any kind of marauders. And that monastery is where they have the library, where we were able to spend some time. Now, this library that they have at the monastery is a subterranean library. You have to go down uh, a few steps in uh, past one locked door, then past another locked door, and then finally you get uh, beneath the, the earth to get to this place that has been around for hundreds of years. And when you enter, there's a sign there. It says, um, Psychis Yatrion, uh, healing for the soul. And it's just a magnificent library, not very large, but here's all these ancient manuscripts, uh, treasures of the church that have been preserved by them and actually copied by the monks of form, former generations. Uh, this is where we spent our time examining the manuscripts, photographing them. They set up a nice little copy room for us. It was just a, a wonderful environment for us to work in. And it's, it's one of the best collections, and not only one of the best collections, but one of the best preserved collections uh, anywhere in, uh, in the Mediterranean world. Uh, today, uh, Potmos uh, is an island of only about 3,000 people, and that's during the summertime when they have a lot more folks who live on the island because they get visitors. Uh, typically, people come to the island by way of a cruise ship, and they'll be there just for a few hours. They'll take a bus uh, up the mountain to see the monastery, get their pictures taken, and then they, they're out of there. Uh, the, the life on this island is uh, very typically Greek. It's a mountainous island. 80% of Greece is mountainous. Patmos is uh, just the same way. People love to ride their scooters on Patmos, and when they do so, it, it, it almost functions like it's a family vehicle. Almost more often than not, you'll see two riders on a scooter as opposed to one. And every once in a while, you'll see three riders on these little itty-bitty scooters. One time, we saw a family of four, and they also had their groceries with them. Uh, it was just unbelievable that they would be doing this on a scooter. And besides, the roads are so tiny, it's hard to get around with anything much bigger than a scooter. We got an SUV that was a one-liter engine, a uh, little car that we could uh, jam four people into uh, with a shoehorn, and that was about as big as they get there. And when those buses get on these mountain roads, everybody runs for daylight. They're just trying to get out of their way because these guys do not swerve for anybody. They do have taxis also that haul people up there uh, on the mountain roads. And these taxi drivers, I think, are all from Athens because they're nuts. It seems almost as if they're trying to hit you, but they, <laughs> they drive like madmen. And you simply stay out of their way. If you see a taxi coming, you, you just kind of pull off to the side of the road, wait till they pass. They will pass you. Uh, coming behind you, they'll go much faster than the speed limit. You've got to just pull off to the side of the road or you'll get run over. One of the ways in which uh, we have distinguished ourselves at these uh, uh, monasteries is to try to honor them by wearing the same kinds of clothes that they wear. What our outfit is, is long sleeve black shirts, black pants, black socks, black shoes and we have black backpacks. All of our equipment is in black cases, 
So when we come to the monasteries, we're hauling all the stuff and we just look like three monks who just got off the island of someplace. <laughs> Our first day there, there was a, a priest who was a liaison between the abbot and us. The abbot is the head of the monastery. And he asked us, he said, why is it that you all are wearing black? And our response was, uh, we wish to honor the monastery. Uh, we have been told that, that uh, some of these monasteries are really amazed that anybody would ever choose to wear long sleeve black shirts in the middle of the heat of the summer. Uh, because they are forced to, this is part of the requirement to, to be a monk there, and for us to choose to do so, uh, they have regarded it as a very high honor. We found that at Mount Sinai, they said, this is amazing that you guys would do this. So we just feel it's appropriate to show them this kind of a respect and to dress the way they do, even though we're not required to do that by any kind of a regulation from them. It's just a deference, and uh, we want to uh, do that for their sake. The Reverend Father... Uh, Abbot Antipas is the man who runs the monastery. He's in charge of it. And he's a very uh, fine, wise, uh, godly man. Uh, he does not speak very much English, just as we do not speak very much modern Greek. And so we need to have an interpreter with him. But what a delightful fellow he was. And we were uh, amazed uh, at how he rolled out the red carpet for us, how he uh, allowed us to eat with the priests and the monks every day in this thousand-year-old uh, uh, dining room with icons on the walls and murals and things. Just, just a magnificent thing. Long stone tables that we ate at, uh, a magnificent time that we had uh, eating with them. It was a great honor to be in the same room with them at the same time sharing a meal. He uh, called us brothers in Christ. He uh, hugged each one of us. Uh, told us how much uh, he was concerned for the gospel and for the scriptures. God bless. We just felt as if uh, the way he treated us is the way Christians should treat one another. And one of the questions that uh, I've asked myself is, if the Orthodox came to America to photograph some of our manuscripts, uh, would Western Christians treat them the same way? And uh, the problem is that I think in many instances we would not. Uh, I think that they have shown uh, far more uh, of a, a Christian attitude, especially the abbot himself. He was uh, just, uh, just not a, at all what one would have expected from a man who had so much uh, authority and so much power on this island that he could have simply closed the doors on us and instead he opened them wide open. And we are exceedingly grateful for that opportunity and for that friendship that we are nurturing. And uh, we're just grateful for this uh, uh, wonderful man, uh, Abbot Antipas. In our final meeting with the abbot, uh, there were uh, a couple of other men there, two or three other men, uh, librarians and the uh, icon restorer. Uh, and in that meeting, uh, he invited us to come back to photograph more manuscripts. He was grateful for the work that we had done, very grateful for the gift that we gave to the monastery. Uh, and uh, he said he was hopeful that the manuscripts that we were able to photograph, that this work would continue to promote the gospel and the Christian faith throughout the world. Uh, we, we just felt as if uh, his warmth and, and uh, friendship and what he had to say to us had opened up huge doors and uh, we're, we're, we're simply extremely grateful for uh, uh, this godly man and for um, uh, the help he has given to us in uh, getting these manuscripts preserved digitally forever. When we get to the monastery, the first thing that we have to do is bring all of our equipment in and set it up, and we're allowed to keep it in a room off, off of the library. Uh, that library is double locked up every day, and then this room is another uh, closed room. Nobody has access to it. Uh, that, that makes our lives uh, much, much easier because we don't have to haul all this equipment up there, up the mountain every single day. Our, our hotel was down in the harbor. Uh, so we set up all the equipment. We have to set up our reflectors, our, our, the cameras. We bring uh, heavy-duty tripods. Uh, we use two computers in the workroom while we're setting this up and there's wires going all over the place. Obviously, we have to have transformers and converters that use the 220-watt system. Setting all this up, the, the nice thing about uh, working in this particular library is they had actually a photography room, and they had some floodlights in there already that we could put our reflectors in front of so it would be diffused lighting, it wouldn't hurt the manuscripts. But what, one of these uh, tables was already set up so we could put the manuscripts on that. The other one we had to use a makeshift table. But it's about as ideal working conditions as we could ever possibly ask for. 
When we prepare these manuscripts to photograph them, it takes about an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, to prep a manuscript. And what that means is uh, each person has to go through a manuscript and carefully document uh, everything that's in there that would be helpful uh, for the photography. So they have to document, most importantly, how many leaves are in the manuscript. And that's going to give them a sense of uh, what they should be counting as they're looking at the images. So the person who's on the computer needs to say, I'm on image 100, what does it say in the leaf here? So we need to make sure that we're lining that up properly. Uh, it's real, real easy to make mistakes with this and skip a leaf or take a picture twice. And so this count and documenting it by putting in slips of paper in the manuscript is extremely important to make sure that we've captured everything and captured it just once. Uh, we also have to measure the manuscript. We check how many columns there are, how many lines per column, what the age of the manuscript is, what the material is, whether it's on parchment, animal skin, or the later manuscripts were on paper, and uh, what the contents are. Is it Gospels? Most of our New Testament manuscripts are strictly Gospels. Several of them are letters of Paul, and others are other New Testament letters. The, the, uh, the monastery on Patmos has only two manuscripts with the book of Revelation uh, in the manuscripts. So this is actually a, a rare and it's kind of ironic that here where John wrote the book of Revelation there's only two manuscripts on the whole island that, that have it. Now when we prep these manuscripts one of the things we're also looking for is are there damaged pages that are either water damaged or have been scraped over again and used by a later scribe for some other purpose which is called a palimpsest which simply means to be scraped again and uh, we are looking to see if there's any kind of images that need to be shot with UV light or a black light because what the UV light does is it gets you to see some things that could not normally be seen or not easily be seen with the naked eye and you can see that underlying text to find out what uh, the scribe actually wrote. We did discover some palimpsests and uh, a year ago we looked at a manuscript that uh, it was it's called Codex 2464 this particular manuscript had about 30 or 40 leaves that had severe water damage so that some of the text was completely unreadable in, in, uh, with the regular uh, photography. We had to use UV photography to be able to, to shoot those. So this is part of the process of what we're doing. And it, When we shoot it under UV light, it'll take about 30 second exposure time to, to get the shot. Uh, this is how we prep these manuscripts. And, and what happens is when we photograph the manuscript, we take the photograph, the photograph uh, uploads onto the hard drive that's attached to the computer and it takes anywhere between five and ten seconds and the computer to monitor checks that to see if the photograph is square if he's got enough room on all four edges if there's a little bit more black on top than on bottom if it's filling the image you know there's all sorts of criteria that we look at to make sure that the photograph is, ex is aesthetically pleasing and at the same time is accurate and then we move on to the next photograph so the computer operator runs two computers simultaneously while there's two different people that are uh, turning the pages on the manuscripts and we can get through uh, 1200 sometimes 1600, 1700 pages in a single day of shooting the manuscripts when we do it this way. It's very efficient. We shoot only the right sides of the manuscript first all the way through, then we flip the manuscript around and shoot just the left sides. And then we com combine those into the same folder and then everything is interwoven so it's in a proper sequence. But uh, the, the work uh, takes uh, quite some time, especially converting the images from what's called raw to TIFF. That'll take a few hours for each manuscript because the average Greek New Testament manuscript is about 550 pages long. And uh, so it takes a few hours to convert this from raw to TIFF. And when it gets into the TIFF format, that's the format that is, is readable. It's, it's uh, where you get the high quality images. Uh, they are anywhere between 32 megabytes and 48 megabytes per picture. So it's very high resolution very easy to read and one of our goals with the photographs is that we always want the photograph to be easier to read than the actual manuscript would be and that has always been the case with the 60,000 photographs we've taken so far. One of the most important manuscripts that we came to photograph uh, at this monastery is known as Gregory Alland number 1175. Gregory Alland is a system it's a universal system that is, is used by New Testament scholars to identify a particular manuscript. Now obviously uh, a unique manuscript that's in a particular library is going to have its own particular shelf number. 
and that shelf number works just for that library. So Codex 1175 on the island of Patmos is known as Manuscript 16. That's just the number they give it. That's not the way New Testament scholars know about it. So the Gregory Allen system is a way to catalog all of these manuscripts by the same numbering system and I identify them in a unique way. This particular manuscript uh, was written in the 10th century, so it's uh, over a thousand years old, and it's a manuscript especially of Paul's letters. And uh, one of the remarkable things about it is that even though uh, it's an important manuscript textually, in terms of its beauty, its look, uh, it doesn't look all that terrific. I've never seen any other manuscript that had a child's handwriting on it more than just uh, one or two times until I came across Gregory Alland Codex 1175 or Manuscript 16 on the island of Patmos. A child's hand has written out the alphabet about 20 times in this manuscript and has also written out numbers 1 through 20 about 10 or 15 times and then it, the child had doodle on it. It's, it's got uh, pictures of animals all over the place and there's one uh, picture where it, it looks like it looks like a pilgrim is is shooting a gun at an Indian who's firing an arrow back at him. I have no idea what it is. It was uh, one of these invite your obscure relative to the monastery day and a and, uh, little kid just uh, jumps in and and uh, writes all over this thing and then finally his uh, uh, second cousin once removed discovers what he had done and sends him home with <laughs> a, a warm bottom, let's say. This manuscript, though, is a very important one for us to understand what Paul wrote originally because it has a very good pedigree to it. Some of the other manuscripts are significant not just for the text that they have, but what are, are known as miniatures, or sometimes they're called icons. And uh, Patmos has a number of them that have uh, uh, some wonderful icons in them. These are uh, magnificent uh, images of uh, the evangelists of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And one of the manuscripts that's in their museum, which is Codex 1164, also known there as Codex 80, or Manuscript 80, is one that they keep in the museum at, at Patmos, and they open it up to a leaf that has this miniature of John. It's all in, in gold leaf and then a painting on top of that. Just magnificent Byzantine artwork. Uh, and uh, you've got uh, images of John in some of them, in images of... Uh, uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke in uh, some of these, and then the handwriting is magnificent uh, in uh, many of these manuscripts as well. The manuscripts often will have patristic commentaries in them, ancient church writers who would comment on the biblical text, and they would always distinguish the commentary from the text in such a way that made sure that the reader understood that the text was more important than the comments. And I think this makes a significant point because it helps us to understand that Scripture has been venerated for centuries in both the Eastern and the Western uh, forms of Christianity more than the, the traditions about Scripture. It's only in modern times that sometimes we flip that around and the traditions have become more important than the Scripture. But one of the ways they'll, they'll have the commentary is they will put in the center of the page in larger letters the biblical text and then the commentary is all the way around the manuscript, so you can see uh, this is commentary in smaller uh, font size that comments on the biblical text. Another way that they will do it is to put the biblical text in a different color of ink. In one of the manuscripts on uh, Patmos, uh, it, the, the biblical text was first written out all in red letters, and then the scribe went back and traced over all that with gold letters. The red was kind of uh, like what an artist might do to, to write something out in pencil first, and then he would paint it in and fill it in with some, some beautiful uh, artwork. Regardless of how they did it, the scribes always recognized the centrality of the scripture, both in their life and in their work. And uh, these manuscripts are giving a very high visual display of the importance of uh, the Bible to these uh, scribes from many centuries ago. The Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts is dedicated to taking high-resolution uh, digital images of all Greek New Testament manuscripts that we can possibly gain access to. And in order to do this, uh, as I mentioned, it costs about six or seven dollars per page uh, for each uh, uh, photograph. There are approximately 1.3 million pages of 
Greek New Testament manuscripts that are known to exist in the world. And we have already photographed uh, uh, several thousand of these, but it's just a drop in the bucket of all that needs to be done. But uh, we're, we're making some good headway on this. And uh, as, as I said, this costs uh, quite a bit of money and we would hope uh, to find more and more mature people who recognize the significance, the importance of preserving the scriptures digitally uh, for future generations. Uh, these manuscripts are deteriorating, and not only the manuscripts deteriorating, but older uh, photographs of them that were all done on microfilm, which are very poor quality compared to the digital uh, quality that we use, uh, are deteriorating as well. And so uh, there's a, a sense of urgency about this. Uh, not only do we have deterioration, but sometimes there's fires, theft, a lot of the manuscripts go missing, and uh, we, we have to get these photographed uh, while we have the opportunity, have the funding, have the travel ability to do this. And so we would appreciate uh, your support in this uh, uh, vital mission.